Здравствуйте, мы э, очень рады, что на, э, в этом году на наш воркшоп «Точки ветвления» к нам приехал Роб Стюарт Смит. А, Роб Стюарт Смит э, является э, одним из директоров э, студии э, DRL в архитектурной ассоциации. Э, эта студия занимается э, э, исследованием в области э, компьютерного архитектурного проектирования и uh, advanced uh, geometry. Uh, также uh, Роб uh, является со-директором uh, студии Кокуджи. И, собственно, мы очень рады, что он uh, сегодня нам расскажет и покажет uh, то, чем он занимается. Thanks. It's nice to be here in Stroka. So I'm talking on um, matter, energy, and force today, and how design could be considered uh, a search for qualitative effects in the formation of architectural matter, or a way of organizing. What you're looking at here is uh, Godfrey Reggio's film Quinescazzi, which uh, impacted a generation through its portrayal of temporal cycles that operated through the flow of people, cars, cities and weather, an environment constantly in flux. It was filmed using uh, time-lapse, high-speed photography, where the world was revealed in another time scale, where flows of energy and matter became more apparent. Our cities and architecture operate at numerous physical scales and for various durations. We're in an environment that consists of the flow of materials and energy. Um, this is a quote from Uh, Eric Mendelssohn, uh, that discusses uh, his realization that, that architects could abandon a mechanical theory of dead matter and from primal states deduce the laws determining interactions. And I put this up because it's not only a recognition that of energy and matter as something that are volatile or in relationship to another, but it's the recognition that design involves undertaking the relations between these things. So it's actually working at a small scale of interaction. And this is something that is perhaps more relevant today than it was to Mendelssohn with things like chaos theory, um, where we understand the mathematics of chaos as uh, something... Sorry, one second. Can't hear myself. <laughs> um, we understand chaos theory as a as a mathematical unpredictability that pervades our entire environment. Like this uh, pattern of weather, for instance, weather is something entirely unpredictable, yet mathematical pr mathematically proven. Um, and it bears some relevance a little bit to some of the ideas of design process that people like Christopher Alexander talked about, where here he talks about design involving a number of different constraints. Like, so he has different aspects here in this diagram that a designer might be considering and how these might involve a hierarchy in terms of the priorities and design decisions. But that there is a differentiation in the way those decisions are related to one another. I worked for many years for Grimshaw Architects on, on a, this project in, in Melbourne, a train station where their design, um, the design of Grimshaw's office was looking at environmental performance through the form of this roof structure that actually allowed for a natural ventilation to occur through the peaks on the roof. It's probably one of the best examples I've seen of environmental performance having a tight relationship to space and form. But I still think this is one project that has actually kind of shifted my direction a little bit because I compare it to this project of Antoni Gaudi's. This is an uh, uh, operative model for the Sagrada Familia. You might know this model. It's a catenary model, which means that it forms perfect catenary curves, intent, which become perfect intention. And if you invert it, you get a perfect compression structure. So this is a structural model, but what I like about it is it's also a design model. And the character of each curve is the character of which is generated in the model 
and becomes the character of the project they're in. So here I call this an operative model because design is operated through the model. It's not a model made to represent a design. It's a model made to operate on. Similarly, Fry Otto developed soap film models that deal with minimal surface tension and he would make architectural models to calculate uh, roof surfaces in this way. So here, once again, you have a physical model that is negotiating uh, force through material properties of surface tension, in this case, to generate a design. So design is generated through uh, a model. The thing is, with models like this, you can't incorporate 50 million design ideas within something that is undergoing physical change. I mean, in this case, it's dealing with structure and then the designer's design intent in the set out. With computers, we can do a whole lot more today because we can expand the number of negotiations that take place. That is, if we actually understand a computer is, can be used for more than drawing. Um, I mean, this person isn't even drawing on the computer, but, but when you delve into the computer, uh, and you look at the way it's actually structured, this is actually how it's operating. Um, yet we like to imagine it's perhaps more like this. Um, but today it is becoming ever more present that actually what is being computed is actually getting computed in real time. Like in this case you have cars detecting pedestrians and so there is a real-time communication and therefore, real-time execution of computer code within the built environment. So not only, perhaps, is this something relevant for design, it's becoming maybe relevant to actual our inhabitation of architecture and urbanism in real time. And when I mean computer code, I mean things like this. This is the way we tend to work in the office. Um, it's through writing code. It's what also people in the workshop are doing. So this is software code. I should give the translator some time to catch up. But this is software code. And this somehow is where we have to, if we want to engage in allowing the computer to participate in design, we have to find ways to put design intent within text rather than through the pencil. And it becomes incredibly frustrating um, doing that. I'll start with a very simple example of how you might put design intent within something abstract. These are three facade options, just like you would have on any project, whether it's computed or not. Um, for a rest Japanese restaurant in Polenco in Mexico City, um, that we did the facades for Michelle Rodgkin, who was the architect of the project, it's a twin skin facade, and like any design project, we were designing variations to explore how we could control opacity, um, privacy, um, to the different spaces of the restaurant. The, the difference here would be that it was very quick and rapid to explore variation. And um, we were able to curate certain visual and perceptive effects within the building uh, just through the, the way that we could control the negotiation between one space and another. What you see there though is something that you could do actually quite manually. It was done through a tractor-based computational code, which means there's a series of points um, that regulate the scale of the openings. Whereas this, these are examples of algorithms written by Stephen Wolfram, a mathematician, where they have simple rules described up the top, and they generate really unpredictable things. You cannot see a relationship between what is created and the rules that create this. Particularly in this example here, which is uh, a good description of emergence where you start to see quite a complicated or complex I should say not complicated uh, Structure emerging that is very unpredictable from the initial starting point up the top So we've been writing algorithms a little bit like this sometimes it involves thinking at a smaller scale than one normally would 
In this case, this is a uh, performing arts center in Taipei, which consisted of a roof structure, three wooden uh, volumes that enclose the auditoria, and a back of house cafe public space within this concrete podium. So we started by designing a fractal logic, which means that you can, you can replace one object with, in this case we're replacing one object with four smaller objects again and again and again. So this was how we actually designed the podium. We started to think of how you could define something like a podium, which is quite large, I think it's roughly about 150 meters long, but defining it through smaller volumes where there were two elements, a glass element and a concrete one. This element was articulated through three different scales. That's a scale of a person there. And you could insert those scales within, you could basically replace a glass volume in a larger piece with the entire unit at a smaller scale. There's, this is where the design had to be very deliberate at this scale as to what it wanted to create an entire podium. So in this case, this, this was a fractal tile we designed in 3D that um, was designed so that you could circulate through the glazed elements, which meant that we deliberately wanted a diagonal movement in plan and section. And that was actually what structured this kind of arrangement here. And then, not only does that structure the spatial organization in the podium, it also starts to deal with depth and articulate facades. And you can just see part of that podium here. So this is just dealing with, in this case, the interior planning of a, of a podium, just through developing one object and then think, but designing that object in a way that it starts to proliferate and connect in various ways. Interiors were designed in a similar way. So what you see there as looking relatively complicated is actually made out of one geometrical element that is repeated multiple times. These things are very geometrical, what I'm showing you so far, but most of our work is not so geometrical actually. And it derives from uh, a use of uh, agent-based logics or bespoke algorithms we write that rely on a series of particles in space being given autonomous decision-making capability. And it's something as abstract as a point in space to be endowed with design intent is, is kind of a struggle that we've always had. How do you embody design intent within code? Um, this is an example of a simple agent-based algorithm um, uh, that Craig Reynolds wrote that's using three discrete vector rules in order to simulate flocks of birds. So it's this, this is very similar, say, to the types of code we write, although we're not simulating birds. But a good thing to think about is birds here are computing their position relative to each other in space and time. Ants use similar algorithmic logic to deal with assembly. And termites use that same logic to orchestrate construction. This is a diagram by Bonobo and Theralaz, um, French scientists, who have done computer simulations to uh, demonstrate the computational logic in the way the termite mound is built. And it, it follows similar algorithmic rules to the kinds of ones that we use in the office, although for obviously very different tasks. Why are we interested in this? We're interested in creating a complex architecture. And I think when you hear this, you're already misunderstanding exactly what I mean by that. Godzilla is complex. Um, Godzilla has lots of parts. A car is complex. And I'm sure a building has, I don't know if many parts as that car, but it depends on the project. Um, but comp one idea of complexity would come from Richard Dawkins. Um, this is a drawing from a book of his um, looking at the human eye and he talks about complexity being something where it's an element is made of many different parts that are heterogeneous but somehow together they operate and perform a useful function. He considers that something that is complex. Ed L Edward Lorenz, a climatologist, um, describes complexity as something a little bit different that's also useful. He talks about 
something being complex if it's sensitive to its initial uh, starting conditions, what he calls sensitive dependence. So this is a graph of a strange attractor. If there's a slight change in the setup, everything completely changes in the result in a way that could not be predicted before. And then there's also the character or the aesthetic of complexity. In this case here, we have a snow drift. This is something Lorenz also talks about. He describes how it would be very difficult to, well, it would take a long time to describe the exact geometry of those curves. Imagine issuing a set of drawings with radii for each of those as an architect or rationalizing it to arcs and straight lines. But what if you just, for instance, asked a CNC machine rather than draw those curves to actually execute the algorithm you execute on your screen? In that case, this thing could be described in maybe three lines of code. So there's a complexity there is not to do with the geometry, but the rules or behavior governing the way that it's created. It's, it starts to suggest something a little bit different to, say, this drawing in um, Vitruvius's 10 books of architecture. In this case, there is a, this is describing relationships amongst parts, but these parts are, are operating still at a very discrete level. And we're not talking also about complexity like Venturi, um, which is discussing contradictions, or or something complex because it is um, difficult to build, such as you see in the, the Gary example, something that's geometrical diffi difficult is not necessarily what we're talking about, although it could be. But this is an example of an art project of ours where each element here is identical. You can kind of see one of the base units. Um, like it's just a little X, basically. But it's a swarm system. So each of these X's has autonomous decision making and makes and breaks its connections with adjacent X's. And um, why that's, I would call that complex is that you start to see a lot of effects emerge at different scales. There's a hierarchy of, of uh, effect. So you start to see almost textile like ripples or zebra patterns and then you get uh, it's topologically varied, like you see different quantities of openings. And this is all coming from the same set of rules across the entire image. Uh, this, is a, this is an example of one of those up pieces running in t real time. And you can see that in every frame, the entire image is, is changing. So this is looking at uh, how to create something that is rich in diversity, but generated through very simple rules. And if you zoom in on it, you start to see more of the, of the detail that is actually constructing that thing. It actually has a fractal-like quality. So that's an example of points in space being given geometry and the geometry being given rules in order to connect. Another example here would be how we actually make uh, decisions being given to trajectories or curves that get created in space and time. These are catalogs of variations. I had students doing a workshop of, of one very simple rule set. So here, here's an example though. This is a, a recent competition for um, the Collider Activity Center, a rock climbing center. It's, it's a project where the client for the project was actually a fabricator of rock climbing walls. So they knew all too well the differences between how to make a very simple wall and a complex double curved wall. And they wanted an exciting you know, space for climbing. So what we started to do is we were looking at Petra and the way that um, pattern and articulation were totally embedded within the volumetric organization of material. 
Like pattern was not something applied to the outside, but it something that governs depth, like you like when you carve out rock. So we were trying to create a building that was carved out. I mean, this is actually the project. Um, but what's going on here is that the pattern is is something that is intrinsic to the volume. Like you can see when you turn the corner that the contours turn the corner with it, as if you've sliced the building out of a larger solid. And that that pattern is generated through also an agent-based behavior and is, is different on the inside relevant to the rock climbing walls than it is to the outside. And you can see here it's even traversing onto the glazing as just a, a visual feature. And the idea here is that architectural order could be perceived spatially as something that is greater than any one material, for instance, that it could perhaps traverse materials and spaces. And I think, I mean, perhaps Victor Horta did it even better than that project. And it would be, I think, one of the projects we'll do soon, we really want to see how, even in a greater sense, this type of transition can take place. How something that is perhaps operating at a level of ornament somewhere becomes structural somewhere else um, and surface somewhere else. But the... The idea of creating architecture from curves might seem abstract, but it's more like giving a curve uh, design intent in the same way that the pencil is given design intent. It's like, how do you feed decisions into something? In this case, this is almost as if we've sketched this project, but it's been sketched digitally. This is the, uh, an invited competition for the National Art Museum of China. We were collaborating with Xu Pei about two or three years ago. And Xu Pei is a Chinese architect who was very determined that the building registered a little bit like a cloud um, because of its cultural context in, in China. And, and the site just next to the bird's nest is 240 meters long. And our job was to basically enclose a 240, me sorry, 240 meter long building, the site was larger, um, around these concrete gallery volumes and to provide enough natural light down to the podium below. The building has a series of holes, you can see, um, that allow light down to the podium. And it sits just above the landscape. It's generated, though, through these curves where particles are wrapping the gallery volumes. And these particles have local decision-making capabilities so that they can control the amount of connectivity they make between each other. So in this case, uh, this is the glazing structure for the project. And it has an inherent or intrinsic relationship to the glazing tiles. And it's difficult for you to perhaps see from here, but um, can you see this dot? No. Just in this top uh, corner up there, you can start to see there's some vortexing patterns. So two things to note here is that this building envelope is generated through a series of curves that create surface. And that those curves also distribute a glazing tile that is 300,000 panels, which are all the same size and shape and that they're not a direct subdivision of the surface itself, but they have their own material distribution. So you can see that this is an architectural model of the project here, but the tiles themselves have an order, and that order is trying to break down the scale of this 240 meter long building into something a little bit more, uh, let's say, closer to a human scale. So here, material distribution, is something um, that's inher intrinsic to the actual formation of the overall geometry of the building. This is a study of the same tiling technique and some interior shots. This is a close-up of the landscape for this project as well. And as 
no matter what distance you are from that landscape, you start to actually register different effects. Um, and this is something that was important with such a large building, by giving it a, a um, let's say, a generative technique for designing uh, through local rules, there was able to be a hierarchy of order that is registered from different distances of the building. So you could, I mean, so this is a, you can read this on the screen, but the idea that emergent order can register a hierarchy of effects at different scales. So this can also be applied uh, to ideas of structure and ornament. Um, this is uh, a series of uh, in-progress design images from a concrete exoskeleton tower in China from about five years ago. And once again, in this case, the design decision was that we would design this building through giving agency to curves. So we would distribute a series of curves, and these curves would self-organize and connect in order to create a redundant structure. A redundant structure, similar to, say, this glass sponge, is a structure that um, has more than one route to distribute its load. So in this case, rather than having a straight line down to the ground, the structure gets dispersed and distributed amongst many elements. It, the idea was that, um, that the project would be column-free interior and just a concrete exoskeleton. And it would read like an Erwin Hauer architectural screen where, where there is a certain topological complexity where you cannot easily see through directly from too many places. This is a section through the, the skin. The idea was that part of the skin would become inhabitable outside. And although it looks complicated, it's, ac it's actually following some very simple principles to build. Like if you look at the top right, uh, of the image, the actual end, the skin or the facade has two voids being created and they meet in the middle. So it's actually, most of the facade is, is planar and it's just got these two void formers in the concrete from either side. So this is an idea of a, a structural organizational principle that is, that is generating the overall spatial, for well, more the, not so much spatial, but the formal and ornamental qualities of the facade. And it's the structural facade. Another example that would be in an airport um, that we collaborated with Bureau Happel on research as well as design. In this case, um, for Riga Airport, we were looking at um, the fact that most airports tend to privilege uh, departing passengers and forget about arrival passengers. I'm often very depressed when I arrive in airports. They're all, always horrible spaces and all the money is spent on a big roof that only the departing passengers enjoy. What we decided to do was to emphasize a ceiling. Make the ceiling the important thing because this ceiling would be between the arrival and departing passengers. We could spend all the money there on the project and then departing passengers could ascend through the ceiling, feel like they're ascending to heaven, and then you would have all the messy retail. Um, I'll show you in a sec. That's, so you have a simple exterior, um, and you have all the messy retail on the top floor above the ceiling, which is something that's always been a problem in the three-level typology of airports. And what it means, though, is with the check-in on the ground level, that there is literally just a glazed corridor between the check-in and the planes. So this idea of a, a mediated ceiling um, was something that, because it was inside and it was a ceiling and it was structural, we decided it could be exciting and it could also be ornamental. The collaboration with Bureau Happel was that we actually generated the ceiling as, as something that was not... We 3D modeled the exterior, but we did not 3D model the ceiling. The structure, or the primary structure, the ceiling, was generated through our agent code. And it basically consisted of hundreds of thousands of nodes 
that were distributed in strands. And those strands, each node had no knowledge of the overall roof. What each node knew is that it would get analyzed constantly in a structural engineering uh, package that Bureau Happel connected to our agent code. And each node would find out how well it was performing. And if it was not doing too well, it would choose to make or, well, it would make or break connections, basically, to neighbors. And this co constantly went on. So this roof would start moving everywhere, making breaking, and then eventually most things would come to rest and a little bit of it would keep fizzling away for a while and then almost nothing would move. And by that point, we had a structure that was not regular at all, but had resolved itself. And it would have very different characteristics or properties at different locations on it. Some areas it was just a flat surface, like a shell structure. Other places it had more waffle slab qualities or truss-like qualities. So this is that ceiling. And it, it's, it's not the cheapest ceiling to build, but it's, it's actually a structural ceiling. And, and the idea there is that ornament has become completely structural. The, uh, it's, not, it's not an argument for uh, the most efficient roof structure. It's an argument for an architectural um, proposal which has um, no superfluous material in a way, where it's expressive, excessive, but intrinsic to the structural solution. So it's an idea of intrinsic ornament. This principle um, is also seen in an another proposal we did in Sao Paulo for a client for a pe pedestrian bridge where we were looking at carbon fiber structures. And we had a uh, local means there to actually make that quite economically. But the principle there, and it's been done in case studies before for pedestrian bridges, is that the, the reduction in, in weight reduces the cost of foundations, footings, um, transportation and maintenance costs are considerably less than they are for steel and concrete bridges. So, so we had an economical argument for a really high-tech material. And what it also meant was rather than think of formal qualities as cosmetic, like things that were forced there and had to then be structured behind, we could think of them more as intrinsic to an overall solution, such as you see in the, the ridges on the crustacean. This is, this is actually the design process happening. Not in real time, obviously, but... Um, so we start with a very simple tube. And as that tube becomes more and more topologically complex, and what I mean by that is I mean it starts to get holes added to it, or it starts to get legs. As this happens, the more complicated it gets, the more structurally efficient it gets. And not just at the macro level, also down to the level of detail. Like this model, which has a lot less structural problems, has these micro ridges through it. So the idea here is that, um, that the extra detail is actually giving this more efficiency. So the more uh, formal expression and the more micro organizational principles there are embedded within this form, the less material you actually need. So excess of, of detail becomes uh, the inverse when it comes to actually the cost and the, the materiality involved. Um, so once you've, once you've actually had to generate a three-dimensional formwork for something like this, to actually give that formwork a little bit more detail is not really adding considerable cost especially when you consider it's lightening the structure using less of quite expensive materials. So this, is, this structure that you saw before, the pedestrian bridge, was something that was changing topologically. Like, so this is a diagram of a mathematical description topology, where surface is described topologically if it, can't be, if it can be transformed um, without being broken or cut then it's um, topologically equivalent. It's something we're quite interested in because it's also something that um, 
happens in natural processes of formation, such as the gastrulation, the in the embryogenesis, the, the making of the gut happens as a topological move, um, as Lewis Wolpert shows. And this is a less credible image by Stuart Pivar of a similar process, but he's also conceiving there in these diagrams of how you could generate any shape from a topological change, all the way down to micro detail. So the, these images are interesting in the sense that their conception of formation that happens as a series of topological changes over time. And so this is something we started to notice when we were dealing with agent-based behavior. Like in this case, I don't know how well you can see that, but this is just a very simple swarm of agents um, that have attraction and repulsion. Some people in the workshop were creating something exactly like that in 2D the other day. It's, it's a sphere inside a sphere. And um, the interesting thing there is that the sphere is persistent, even if it's formally changing. So it's what we call a dynamic stability. It's, it's resolved itself as a sphere. It's got a kind of topological definition that won't change. But every frame, it's a slightly different shape. It's not a perfect sphere. Um, but these types of formations were uh, early attempts at how to actually develop a topological form through a series of particles that were given decisions in a very abstract sense, but very difficult to constrain, um, very difficult to design anything like that. So this is an open-ended, bottom-up system with no ability to actually kind of harness it in a useful way. So this was one way we started to look at how we could hybridize it for design purposes. In this case, it's hybridizing an agent-based system with a springs network. So this is springs without agency. You can start to see that they're giving a surface tension and they're defining an actual surface. Um, and this is uh, an agent, um, in, in, um, basically agent decision-making given to a surface with tension that starts to define itself in three-dimensional space. And then this is considering almost like fashion design tailoring where you can even determine how elements stitch together. Or topological change, how, how elements can actually bridge. So what we have here now is we, I showed you projects that started with points, uh, projects that started from conceiving of curves as being given rules. Now we're looking at how surfaces are given rules. And in this case, the color coding is coming from the vertices of the surface ha becoming self-aware of where they are on the surface. So once again, they have no knowledge of I am a surface or I exist as an entity. It only knows what it is locally. So each node is working out if it's on an edge or if it's in the middle of a surface. And as it does that, it, they perform different tasks. So when you see something like this, all the colors are actually, they have different rules. And elements are changing color over time. This was first tested um, on a competition project in Korea. And different from the abstract studies you saw, this is actually the, what we call the design template for generating the exterior. So it's not to say that the entire project's generated this way, but the envelope of the project is generated this way in a constant negotiation with a 3D uh, programmatic model that was tested against it. So in this case, um, being the first version of this code, uh, this project took 3,000 um, simulations. <laughs> it took way too long. Um, and no, numerous design templates. And in fact, this is the last one. So this is actually what is fed into the computer. And this is what is fed out. Um, you can see it a bit more clearly here. But it's something that starts as a very s a straightforward volume. And it turns inside itself and pushes through itself to define a series of auditorial volumes and fly towers. And then it, it also creates a series of pedestrian bridges that you might see at near the end of this in yellow, but 
It's a bit hard to read. So it's a mix of a bottom-up system with some top-down constraints. And it's a hybrid of about three or four different computational logics. It mixes uh, things like swarm systems, um, nonlinear dynamic spring systems, cellular automata, kind of neighborhood rule logics. It's not about a pure representation of any computational technique. It's just about trying to work out a way of designing a, an exterior for a building. Um, now the project um, goes from a, a opaque ceramic to a transparent glass. And there's a transition in, in translucent glass in between. So where you're overhanging the water, you have a kind of transparent glazed figure. The the thing to point out here, and the reason I, I, I talk about this project, is that the, the small local qualities in the actual formal result, they're not there because they look pretty or they look ugly or whatever you think they look. Um, and they were not modeled after we had an overall shape or silhouette for the building. These things like you see up here, these little kind of skinny bits or down the bottom or these little sharp element on the top, those are actually the telltale signs, they're the little hints to you of actually how this thing came into being in the first place. It's through those little local negotiations that the entire form turned inside out because those things start to pull and tug that the entire volume became what it was. You cannot separate those from the actual generation of the entire thing. So. It's a, it's a, for us, it's an example of formation arising from local relationships or interactions. And it starts to take on different kind of muscular-like qualities and that you can see in close-up. The interior is designed in a si similar way and you can start to read the tension where it, the volume has to kind of shrink to fit the proscenium opening. So that previous project had no, um, let's say, tectonic constraints whatsoever. It was, uh, I mean, we realized that we could resolve that. It wasn't within the computational model. This is a facade for a shopping mall we did with Rodgkin Arquitectos in Mexico, in Interlomas, where it's the absolute opposite. In this case, it's very constrained. Um, all we're looking at is how we can create a quite a rational ruled surface facade around the exterior of of what was a new shopping mall, a circular shopping mall. So in this case, um, it's actually generated in a way that it could never be anything but a straight surface. Um, and so some of those qualities, it's not exactly the same design process at all. It actually doesn't have all those micro qualities, but I've gone from showing you something that has it to something that's geometrically rational that doesn't. Um, which led to the next thing. And this is, uh, this is a sketch model trying to describe how the process you saw in the green project could be rationalized as a tectonic idea. So here you have a series of elements that are, are meant to be all the same size and shape. And that they could be distributed in such a way that when they pinch together they form a structural rigidity. The point here is to try to think of how you could make something complex that tries to address this kind of problem of waste and tries to address it through ideas of mass production so that we get away from this problem where in this example you have something that's geometrically complex but it requires um, many different panels to be many different shapes. So it's an idea that complexity could be more economical so we return to the, the idea of flocks of birds. The fact that they are all the same, essentially, but that, that together they are creating something different. So I ran a, a fabrication studio with Robert Booth in St. Louis, where we were looking uh, at projects like this, a mathematical surface or Projects like um, these ones of Fry Otto, Minimal Surfaces, or Felix Candela. All these examples are of highly efficient structures. These became the anti-models. 
they were anti-models because although they were, uh, I mean, they're brilliant projects. I have a lot of deep respect for them. Um, but they're anti-models because their expression comes purely from a structural rationale that becomes monolithic in, in character. Um, so the idea was how could we hybridize um, different structural principles together in a way that was a little bit more expressive. So the hybridization here of post-tension compression, cable net suspension, and then drapery like you see in the Bernini sculpture. And we wanted to put those into, um, we wanted the design this time to be similar in concept to the opera house that you saw in the green surface, but this time, rather than an algorithm generating the form, it would be the assembly that generates the form and the structure. And this is the one architectural drawing you need to build this small, very small installation. So this drawing would tell you how to actually do these kinds of operations. And these operations are, are both uh, organizational as well as formal and structural. For instance, if you make a closed circle, um, it allows for less movement than if you have an open surface. So there's a difference in the, the strength of the structure. The idea here would be that every part would be the same size and shape, and every part would have a loose connection in every access to every other part. So the idea was to have a structure that was not wanting to stand up, and it could only stand up if it was put together under certain organizational rules. So we had to kind of work them out, so we were looking at, we made 600 prototype plaster pieces and realized that under certain conditions you could get them to stand up quite well and then under other conditions you could even dematerialize the surface down to a series of strands. This is the, the final the parts. Uh, they're precast concrete and they have you can kind of see a ball joint in one axis well in both axes and there's a, a threaded cable running through in two axes as well. And this is the installation. It's, so it starts to, it's self-supporting to a point, and then it starts to collapse down the other side. And as I said before, it's, it's not pulled tight. It's not like a normal post-tension structure. The cables are just there to connect things together. It's a, an incredibly loose, heavy, it's like wearing a wet, piece of clothing actually it's really difficult to assemble <laughs> um, so it's not I wouldn't say it's a complete success but but it proved the point that the organization of the material was enough to define both its structural but also its kind of expressive qualities um, so that was like a, a, a kind of experiment into a tectonic principle um, but this is a project where that kind of got explored a little bit more. Uh, this was a competition. We, we came third in the public vote for the Helsinki Public Library. Um, the site located in Helsinki is, is just on this uh, part, just near all the coaches you see, next to the Chiasma Museum of Stephen Hull and the Parliament House and the Music Center. There was a few just really simple top-down decisions made here, you'll see this project has a lot of top-down um, things and the bottom-up part is really quite small, which is another approach. So we have a few very simple things where we're just aligning to the context where it exists as a rigid element on the site. And then we're starting to bend, like you can see, uh, the, this little building there is a heritage listed shed on the site. So the building is cut to respect a vista through that. And the building also bends to, to align, to face the Parliament House and to provide a, a big opening towards a, a park adjacent. So you can see we've reinforced this boundary here with the context and then we're much looser towards the park and facing the Parliament up the top. Also in the facades you start to see um, the, the street side is a lot more uh, enclosed and, and rectilinear and 
and then things start to perforate and open up much more uh, on the park side. The park side also has this um, kind of tiered seating area that leads up one floor into the heart of an atrium in the center of the library. Um, the project being in, uh, in Finland also we were looking for, for kind of a way into thinking of the material system as having a local side, so the idea of it being timber, also having a, a mix of black uh, and light colored timber and also the fact that it was a library and that now that we're using less books, there's a lot of timber mills that are wishing for a bit more work um, that are actually using renewable timbers. And the uh, environmental constraints of the project, the, the black timber is also very good at hiding things like um, photovoltaic cells and, and water pipes. So in this case, this is the part of the project that was generative. This is part of the project that was simulated um, using the same technique as you saw in the tectonic experiment and the same technique you saw in the green opera house. Um, what, what it is is a series of, of timber elements and uh, in the middle they form an atrium and they're self-supporting. So they're self-supporting at, at these two hole locations and then uh, everywhere else it becomes a suspended ceiling until it comes down and becomes permanent formwork um, for in situ concrete where you have circulation. So it's actually operating in uh, multiple capacities. And then where it's lowered down here, there's actually an auditorium sitting above that. So the ceiling actually comes down um, to become a wall to divide a, an auditorium for the rest of the space. Uh, so it's a laminated timber box, essentially, the, the main part of the building. Um, and then you have the entry from the park side that takes you up one floor. And the self-supporting uh, atrium um, that hybridizes with an in, uh, in situ concrete there as well. What one aspect you see here is the material that's generated, like the organization of the material that's generated in the project is also providing these kind of vistas. So the direction you're circulating is also the direction the timber is organized. Um, so you, the organization of the material is intrinsic to the form, the space, and the method of circulation. And that method of circulation is also providing at ground level an internal street that connects um, from either side of the, of the context to what they call the book bar. This is like a, a conveyor belt that you can take a, a, a very popular current novel or something without actually having to go through security. And winds its way up through the, the center of the atrium. And, and where the timber stops and you have a regular uh, floor space, um, there's a series of contours that start to demarcate the actual terrain that you can inhabit. And then there's a modular furniture system that can be reconfigured within that and it has a suggestion of where it can go based on the contours on the floor. Um, we've been looking a bit at these kind of diorama style images like you see in National Geographic because of their way of kind of conveying multiple things at once. So in this case, like this is like what we call a chunk diorama. You start to see a little bit of how the furniture works within the space, what the material is like, uh, how it's enclosed. And you can see the internal street down the bottom and, and the modular furniture up top. This is the, the top floor library space where you see these ver almost very arch-like qualities, that's where the timber ceiling has become self-supporting. And where it flattens out, it is literally just hung from the timber box. Um, when you start to see it at an overall scale, you start to see that there, there's kind of sharp elements in it where it starts to be pinched together to gain stiffness. And those pinches start to cause these strange kind of ripple-like effects on the outside as well. So, so these kind of, once again, this thing is not at all uh, a discussion really of, of structure or of efficiency. It's looking for an expression within the way we organize material, but we're trying to do it in such a way that it's intrinsic to the space, the form, and the structure. 
So uh, it's an idea of spatial vectors also generating an architectural order. Um, this is an example of, um, this was for a, a client in Sao Paulo who had an architect already designing the office building, but they were prepared to offer us the nine meter high foyer space below. So the first move here um, is to propose a, a shear wall um, and a transfer structure in the slab above the foyer um, so that the building could float. And given the site constraints, here we're, we're looking also at the fact that that ceiling in the foyer is actually more prominent than the facade to someone walking by on the street. And, and so what we've done is we've literally wrapped that. Um, this is not a, a structural system, it's purely a cladding system because of the cost. Um, although it could be structural given uh, a slightly different budget. But the idea here is once again that the material is also orientating uh, the way you arrange through space. So what's happening is as you pass through uh, the security check, the ceiling then leads you back to where you take the lift up. And the, the rings of light turn on and off as you walk. And we have a way of generating that so that each piece is flat. So um, with those last two projects, they're maybe not as complicated in their look, but the idea is that they're trying to take on some aspect of space as a perceptive thing and the way materials are organized. This is an image of John Ruskin talking about um, the fact that ornament within Amiens Cathedral could be detailed to a different level based on the distance from the, the viewer's eye that it would become less uh, needed to be of a certain quality. Or in something like Borromini, you see how detail changes your perception of space, both through, say, the scale and um, order of elements on the ceiling, or through his use of distortion, like in the twisting of these elements here. Um, so one, so before, basically, rather than take on these small kind of discrete techniques like Ruskin is doing or Borromini, where they just form part of a space and then you need to compose multiple parts, the idea in those previous projects is the entire space generates those type of effects. So it's trying to not melt everything together, but try to make multiple things intrinsic to a larger architectural experience. The last um, part of this lecture. I'm going to show you a little bit of the uh, work of um, the studio run at the Design Research Laboratory at the AA, which is taking this same agenda of material organization, or the organization of architectural matter, but taking it from a slightly different perspective, one that's more and more informing the work of the office. Um, and, and that is to do with how we can create qualitative effects from building life cycles. So you're probably familiar with these types of images. I think both of these come actually from AutoCAD, um, talking about, thinking about the entire process of, of making something from the way it's conceived through the way it's demolished or recycled. So we were thinking about the ethics of, of uh, environmental ethics of, of building. But beyond that, we were thinking of temporal cycles, like the temporality of, of, of people's activities, of climates, and the temporality of materiality. Like the fact that um, the world around us is formed in time, where energy and matter are not things to be considered inert. And where if we rethink tectonics, we can often find architectural opportunities, not just engineering ones or, or construction ones. So in this case, I mean, Frank Lloyd Wright was a good example of someone who realized we can cantilever and cantilevering can in structural steel or concrete can offer all kinds of architectural opportunities or meets with glass and transparency um, and production itself can be reinvented like you know that even something like a melon um, if it is rethought in the way it is created could cause efficiencies down the line in the way it's it's transported. So something like transport becomes a design opportunity. So we wanted to get into designing production. Um, 
Some projects were looking at algorithmic logics for dealing with 3D printing. In this case, this is arguing that if you 3D print, um, you can 3D print anything. Why not print the minimal you require to structurally do something, like a house, um, where each element is less than a millimeter thick? So these students had a sponsorship from Materialize, a 3D printing company, and they worked out how to make a, a project from a series of parts. So uh, even though 3D printing can be done on site, the idea was that to tackle prefabrication still of ultra lightweight 3D printing. And this is an architectural model two meters long made of 15 parts, e each made out of fine grain fibers less than a millimeter thick that represent structural lines. But we can also use cheap materials to do larger projects such as this train station proposal, uh, which thought of fabrication itself as a generative procedure. In this case, trying to tackle complex formwork and try to get rid of it. Um, so the students were looking at how one cast could become the formwork for the next cast. So through a sequential operation, you could start to construct complex geometries with, with a very simple formwork. The, the interesting thing about something like this, beyond the practical gains or the economical gains, is that all those little details you see are intrinsic to the process of formation. The way the building is created gives the building its character. So this is an example as well of how matter and energy can be conceived as playing a generative role. This is a, a just a scale model of, of lycra and wire. When you let it go, it becomes this. Um, it's basically the tension in the wire is negotiating the tension in the fabric. Um, another example of that. This is playing off uh, similar variations in, in pre-tensioning in silicon with air and water pressure. I don't know if you can see that so well. But this is made out of flat sheet material. There's no, there's no kind of strange cutting or um, no, no tricks. Just understanding that if you put two materials together with different relationships of of their matter and energy, like that you can start to generate all kinds of strange effects. We can think of, um, in this case, there's, this is also a, this is a, um, a fiber composite project where it's looking at hanging as a way of dealing, removing formwork. So here you have an unwrapped part of a habitable bridge, which is already defining a whole series of tectonic elements. And that is hung and then it, um, and UV cured resin is then hardening that. And the idea here then is assembly starts to also play a role. So this habitable bridge is designed in such a way that it, it doesn't use scaffolding. That, so this was done in collaboration with AKT engineers as well. But each part is assembled in a way that it is held by the previous part. So actually, these kind of renders are more important to that student project than the final project itself, perhaps. We also look into temporalities. This is a catalog showing variations in structural efficiency relative to variations in water distribution efficiency for a project that constantly collects and redistributes and stores water through uh, grooves that are both structural as well as uh, water distribution channels. N not efficient at either, but quite good at doing both. Supple membranes that also absorb water and therefore change their weight relationship to redistribute water over time. 
or erosion being something that is tested um, being to be able to control water flow as well. And computational models developed for simulations that can deal with things like water tracking on the underside of surfaces so that strategizing a material organization in time can allow for changes in, in water flow control. This is a model, that, a one to five scale model that was eroded over six months in the DRL studio. Um, and we were looking for, as I said before, qualitative effects. This was not just an exercise in, in engineering or something. It was, we were looking for architectural qualities that come out of the way we rethink materiality as a design opportunity. And the project was for a, a public bath that part of the space would perforate every year in summer to become outdoor while the rest of the project would be rebuilt every 10 years. Um, maybe the last project I'll show you is on a similar vein. It was a building made from mycelia, mushrooms. These students uh, went to farms, collected all kinds of samples, grew, grew fungus in the studio to the complaint of everyone else in the studio. It stank. Um, but their project is conceived of from what is supply and demand in a way. Once again, production becomes part of the creative opportunity. So uh, China was gener generating the most rice and therefore the most rice hay waste, which is a substrate used for mushroom production. And mushroom consumption was highest in China. I don't have all the images here to show the entire project, but they were looking for ways to use agricultural methods of bundling the hay and impregnating it with the mycelia so that it, they could make it rigid um, like this over time. So um, the project involved finding a, a rice site that was sufficiently urban and working out how much mushroom you could produce on that site and then working out what size building can be produced from that hay and those mushrooms as an annual cycle. So you see here there's scaffolding in some parts. Um, basically the project is built in stages throughout the year and parts of the project are, are growing mushrooms while other parts are decaying and the project's rebuilt. Um, and the project only exists for I think something like three or four months during the year while rice has been produced elsewhere. So, yeah, I mean, in conclusion, I, I guess I've thrown up a lot of things um, and perhaps got, haven't gone into much detail, but all this work has been looking at how you all can strategically organize material, where you can think of design as something that's happening across many scales, but where its qualities produce um, affects that are intrinsic to the, the way that that thing has been formed. It's a process of formation where things like ornament might be as intrinsic to materiality as structure or, or other qualities of space or form. Uh, yeah, is there any questions? Rob, uh, Инженерные вопросы как решались в ваших проектах? Can you repeat, can you repeat that? N not in all, it depends on the stage of the project. Um, for instance, we work regularly with Bureau Happel, AKT2. Um, and even in the academia, AKT2 are heavily involved. S so even the academic projects of the students are addressing key fundamental uh, structural issues. The, the work of the office, the projects that are built, obviously are still standing. <laughs> um, but a lot of the projects that were near to being built are also pretty well resolved. So... Um, but the projects that I think are also the ones that are most questionable are the ones that are often the most proven. <laughs> so, 
for instance, the one I would say looks the most challenging perhaps is the, from my point of view, is the um, airport structure, but it is one of the ones that has had structure interrogated more than perhaps some of the others. Thank you. Thanks. Здравствуйте, спасибо за лекцию большое. И два вопроса. Значит, вы в процессе презентации показывали один из проектов, который выполнен в стиле модерн. Я немножечко не понял, использовался ли там какой-то алгоритм, вы не поясняли. И второй вопрос в целом. Какой софт вы используете для визуализации трехмерной геометрии на основе вот мультиагентного подхода? Тоже как-то не тема не раскрыта немножко. <laughs> Спасибо. Um, okay, I'll try to answer the questions. The modernist project, you're referring to this one? Uh, нет, uh, uh, были эскизы, uh, интерьерные эскизы в стиле модерн. Uh, uh, или это, ну вот Виктор Уорд. Ah, Victor, Victor Horta? Okay, okay. What was the question again about Victor Horta? Ладно, извините, первый вопрос отпал, а второй вопрос, ответьте, пожалуйста. Okay, um, okay second question. Um, the, you ask about the visualization, like, you mean the software that we're actually generating the geometry or the software for actually rendering the image? Непосредственно трехмерную геометрию, да. Okay. It depends on the project. I mean, most projects, we're using industry standard software to visualize. Um, we write uh, algorithms in multiple software languages, mainly Python and Java. But I mean, uh, in the office, there's multiple languages. I personally write in three languages. Other people write in other ones. Um, but the, the actual, like for instance, some things, I should say visualization and code are completely different things, right? So something like this, uh, the methodology that was used in this one and the green surface, that was written in, in processing, so a version of Java. But the only reason it was written there was so that there was a very, that uh, code executes relatively quickly there for having a visual um, window without having to go into writing things in a development kit or raw in C++. Because at one stage that project was just going to be written in a text file and executed just raw. But there was sometimes you need to actually see something quickly to get feedback to change it. So in that case processing is there just for the visual effect but there are no libraries involved except for VEC3D in the actual in that project, everything's just raw code. Um, at the same time, we have put code through programs like um, Rhino, Maya, and of course, if something needs more rationalization, it can go into other things like Katia. But for instance, the the uh, the facade in Mexico, that was um, just done through through um, a little bit of scripting in Maya, and then. Uh, generating the proper geometry in um, Rhino. Uh, вот этот uh, фасад, который... Кафе синее, да? Майя? No, no, that's Rhino. That was done in um, a language we don't use anymore. It was scripted in VB script. Um, and it, it was just generated in Rhino from there. And it, in fact, that was just done in 2D because it's two layers of, of sheets that were water jet cut and then welded together with parts in between. So this was really easy to, to produce. Um, whereas something like this, this was processing um, and then um, a bit of modeling in, in Maya. But it really depends. Like here you see, I mean, that's, that's processing again Rhino, um, and then a whole series of tech. Every project we develop almost like a recipe list of techniques. Um, so in this case, this involved 
uh, all the lines are actually scripted, generated as geometry, but then there's a whole series of mapping techniques as well to deal with the perforation. That, so that actually had to, the geometry had to be unwrapped and then wrapped back on. It was actually quite a pain. But essentially every project has a recipe list. And the reason for that is we kind of feel that like if, you know, if you were a sculptor, you would want to know the material you're working with, right? If you were working with your hands. Or if you were any other kind of artist, you take very seriously the tools in which you do your trade. And when it comes to 3D modeling on the computer, um, it's very easy to become a victim of software if you're designing only at a certain level of resolution. Like most 3D modeling happens through NURBS surfaces or NURBS curves or through mesh models and a bit of subdivision surface. These things have mathematical functions that determine their curvatures and therefore their character. And if you want to develop something that avoids uh, the characteristics of that, then you have to do it, define it yourself at a very small scale. So the scale of what you do dominates over the scale where the character of that technique comes out. So for instance, um, uh, yeah, it just depends, but uh, we also use things like isosurface. Sorry, I probably answered your question five minutes ago. I don't know. Спасибо. Роберт, такой вопрос. Какие основные проблемы, с какими основными проблемами вы сталкиваетесь, переходя уже к непосредственно производству, к созданию этих строений? Какие вообще проблемы должны быть решены в дальнейшем наукой и инженерии для того, чтобы все это ну, создавалось, скажем так, максимально приближено к тому, что вы проектируете? It's a fantastic question, and it, it really depends on where the project is based, right? So, for instance, this project here is, is all done using fiber C, and like something like five, six of it is flat sheet, computer cut, um, and uh, six of that is there, they have a product called 3D fiber C. This project I is in Mexico, um, and it's water jet cut in, like I think you saw, it's water jet cut in parts that are this size, and then uh, it's thin s steel with expander foam inside, and then it's welded on site and ground. Like this kind of thing would cost the earth to do over here, you know, like. I mean, it, where I'm based in London, you would never do you would never do that, right? Because labor costs so much, you could not have this done on site. And while there's a, a huge discussion going on about automation, robotics, I think it really depends where you're working. Because um, sometimes we're working in a place where robotics is efficient and economical, and other times we're finding, like in places like Mexico, we can like. We have another project on site in Mexico at the moment that um, the parts were fabricated in China. They, uh, the tolerance of the parts has not been what was expected and they're getting manually broken and recalibrated on site, uh, GFRC panels, and then uh, patched. And it actually looks really good. Like you would think this type of thing uh, is not a good option, but I guess what I'm saying is Fabrication isn't an issue. What it, you just have to strategize based on where you're working. So, um, and I think more often we want control over, say, some of the shop drawing process, like getting rid of it altogether. You know, so taking on a little bit of the communication with the fabricator, on at least from a geometrical side, not necessarily from all the nuts and bolts side. Does that help? Меня, наверное, интересует еще, возможно, куда должна идти наука, какие проблемы там должны решаться, или в производстве, да, чтобы ну, вот подобные проекты да, были решены, создавались более, скажем, просто, без 
Может быть, это изучение новых материалов или э, способов их обработки. Или наоборот, архитектура должна все-таки, э, э, скажем так, э, исходить из материалов, ну, в первую очередь. Кстати, как вот вы создаете, вы, э, насколько вы э, уделяете внимание вот, э, ну, материалам в самом начале проектов? исходите из их возможностей или все-таки а, уже а, создаете на основе готовых форм, выбираете подходящие материалы? straight away and other things that you know you could bring to the table's possibility. So in this case, sometimes materiality becomes the first decision um, for governing where the project might go beyond other ideas of space and program and things. Other, and for instance, something like form cannot come into that picture before there's already, already a, a kind of other spatial, um, pragmatic construction things sometimes narrowed down. Like you need to know where your budget is, where you can spend money, where you cannot. So often we try to focus uh, the design agency within parts of a project, you know, just like I was talking about the ceiling of the airport, right? So someti like sometimes material, it's not necessarily material in a traditional sense, but at least ideas of materiality or fabrication come first. Other times, they're not a consideration until later on because, for instance, something like the, um, like something like the opera house, the green surface, the material was a concept at the beginning, but the rationalization of the material never happened because it was a stage one competition. We didn't think it was necessary um, and we knew we could resolve it, you know, so it depends. But I think it's a lost opportunity. I think it's good if it is part of the process early. Uh, hello, may I ask in English? Okay, so uh, I wonder if there are any uh, kind of psychological study of the perception, how this type of architecture is being perceived and say so you mentioned that you try to reduce the, the side of uh, small parts so it's kind of more scale, scalable to a human size and for example the uh the Baramini's examples of architecture it was made in renaissance so it was like designed based on human perception all these visual tricks so i see now i perceive this now it's more like a sculptures and yes, there is a certain reason for the you know, material, the, the code, all those kind of things. But do you see this uh, moving to, say, housing and other things, not not only like like the opera and the, the normally perceived as sculptures? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we we're working on a, a residential tower development at the moment in Sao Paulo, and for instance, there, because of the the budget of the project and the um, the scale of the development, there's no, like, going back to this question before, the building's an extrusion because it cannot be anything else, but there's a lot of play in the balconies. Um, and basically the building is articulated at a scale that's running across about 10 floors um, in parts. It's forming these kind of crevices and canyons. And those crevices and canyons are not just a visual or what you call sculptural thing. They're also tied to uh, plantings on the balconies where cool air is captured because those crevices are getting less direct sunlight. So we try to match uh, some pragmatic ideas with some aesthetic ideas because we're interested in both. It's not, we don't think it's one or the other. You know, like if you take out the aesthetic ones or the expression, then I think you're, you're taking a lot of architecture out of the building. Um, and if you, at the same time, if you don't address the pragmatic things like the budget or the fabrication or environmental performance, then you're not being responsible. So, yeah. Thank you. And another small question. So what would, would you be your advice to say there is a, 
a bunch of people here in Moscow wanting, willing to go to move uh, to kind of that direction, design with code, and we, like say, have no experience whatsoever. Okay. So what would be your advice? Thank you. Um, a few things, maybe. Um, first one's more pragmatic. Like, um, my experience of consultants is that they're invaluable. Like, we work with, you know, engineers, environmental um, engineers, civil engineers from very early in projects in conceiving of ideas and working through them. And, and that's incredibly productive because it means that the pragmatic side is intrinsic to the result, but also it reali you realize that you actually have more of a problem than that. They're really good at that, right? And I think architects forget that. They often think that that's the core of the business and it's the only thing. But if you, you work and collaborate with many people, and you have to remember what your role is in there too. What, and I ask that, I say that more as a point, not to tell you it's one or two things at all, more to expand to, you know, I hope we think of more things that are our role and not get distracted on the things that aren't. But we certainly have to make sure other people's roles work well with ours too, right? So we have to collaborate closely. Um, but in terms of if you want to design through writing code, then I would say you have to um, just be patient in that it takes time to learn, but anyone can learn it. I remember a period when I thought it was impossible I would learn to write software code because at the time there was no online tutorials, no uh, kind of architects talking about writing code and you know this kind of thing. There were a few rare people out there, you know, people like Mark Burry or um, John Fraser, but it didn't seem relevant to the average architect. Um, so patience was one thing. Um, and another was just, just letting it become intuitive. Like uh, the way we work now with code, it's, it's not everything, everything doesn't have to be coded. We don't mind picking up a pencil, doing a bit of 3D modeling, writing a bit of code. Um, the question is, when will it be useful? And that's something you just work on over time. When can code provide a creative uh, impact on the project? When could it be useful? If it's not, don't waste your time, right? So we want it to be creative. We want it to be part of the design process. Um, and you develop an intuition for the way code behaves. And when you write a piece of code for the first time, like the f not the first time you write code, but any time, even 10 years later, that you write a piece of code, you think you know how it behaves, but until you actually use it, you don't know. If it's a complex bit of code, it takes a while to actually learn how to use your own code, even if you wrote it exactly the way you wanted. Thank you. Можно задать провокационный вопрос. Я сам профессиональный математик, геометр. И я задам вопрос, на который я знаю ответ уже. Готовы ли вы ответить на такой вопрос? Контрольный. Если нет, вы откажитесь сразу. I'm willing to answer and I may not know the answer. I'm not a mathematician. Тогда такой вопрос. Вот только что вы можете вывести на экран вот только что форму которая была силиконовая и напоминает, э, напоминает э, внутренности каких-то живых существ, может быть, даже человека. Но я как геометр сообщаю вам, что есть в последнее время существует очень много геометрий, которые в том числе и трехмерная, четырехмерная, и фрактальная геометрия. Но геометрии, которые решают вопрос прочности, э, ну какой-то пластичности формы, они определяются двумя геометриями. Это геометрия, так называемая внутренняя геометрия и внешняя геометрия. И вот в рамках этих двух вопросов, значит, вот если мы рассматриваем какой-то биологический, ну, даже можно сказать человеческий э, орган, который очень пластичен, очень динамичен и невероятно тверд в нужный момент. И в нужный момент, и когда он не нужен, он абсолютно 
невероятно мягок. Этот объект располагает половина, почти половина людей, которые здесь находятся в этом зале. Этот объект называется, мне просто не хотелось бы так явно его озвучивать, ну, научно он называется фалос. И вопрос, ну вот, мы не будем говорить э, о том тех объектах, которые у вас были влажные, э, такие мягкие, они напоминали другой объект, который тоже располагает другая половина этой аудитории. Так вот, вопрос такой. Каким образом, вот если мы берем силиконовый объект, производство нашего, это у нас был номер три, ну, там называется объект как-то, возможно, это по-другому, презерватив, вот так надувая его, неважно чем, кровью или воздухом, он получается мягкий, и мы не можем добиться твердости, мы можем завязывать его узлами, но тем не менее никакой архитектурной формы, такой твердой, мы не получим. И тем не менее, вот тот орган, о котором я упомянул в вопросе, он может быть одновременно любой мягкости и одновременно твердости, хотя там, я как вам скажу, что там нет, кость, костей там нет. Итак, вопрос контрольный. Каким образом, располагая абсолютно мягким материалом, можно придать ему удивительную твердость? Спасибо за ответ, и простите, если вас он смутил. Non-Newtonian fluids. Non-Newtonian fluids are incredibly soft and when agitated become very hot. Нет, жидкости есть, кровь, кровь, кровь. Yeah. Um, but, uh, I mean, I, I guess that, I think that answers your question. Um, I won't do any demonstrations of some of the other things you were saying. Um, but, um, in terms of the silicon, the silicon thing I was showing is a small piece, it wasn't a building. Yeah, it, w it was just uh, an experiment of fabrication, um, and it had wire and, and silicon. Um, so it was the competition of the two materials together that, that deal with that. I, I think, I mean, there's been a lot of experiments with soft um, materials in architecture in the 60s. You know, people like Haus Rucka, Kupimoblau. Um, I'm not quite sure exactly what your question was beside the fact that can there be a hard material from a soft one, like a non-Newtonian fluid. Were you asking how I could conceive of, of one operating in architecture? Or? Sorry, one sec. Um, yeah, you <laughs> Скажите тогда нет, я не знаю. I'll think about it, but does anyone have the answer to that? No. Тогда я обращаюсь к аудитории, может быть кто-то из вас знает ответ? So, I'm so sorry for that question. It was too complicated, I think. Oh, uh, I was hoping you'd answer it. <laughs> oh. um, about, just about ma ma mathematics. Um, at the surfaces, you produce um, controlled with some points, or uh, with some laws, or they're just r random. So, uh, how, how you control the, the surfaces? So, such as uh, the ceiling in the airport, or uh, the whole building of the library. Um, I'm just trying to think. I don't think any. I don't think there was any randomness in any of those projects whatsoever. Um, occasionally, we do use randomness only for the purpose of agitation, mm -hmm. um, just to keep things in a, an ability to, so they're still open to negotiation. This is something that people like Lynn McGillis talk about um, in terms of dynamic stability or homeohesis, like where something's like on the edge of chaos, it has to be slightly agitated. And if it isn't, it'll just collapse in on itself, in essentially. But um, most of those things involve very particular starting uh, configurations, whether they're very neutral or whether they're highly specific. So you saw the most specific ones were the opera house um, or, the, or the ceiling of the library, where um, like the opera house, it was defined as the rectangular prism to begin with. Mm -hmm. Um, 
uh, and then the ceiling, I mean the boundary of the ceiling was created and fixed. Yeah. I don't know if that answers or not. And about the library, uh, so how can, how can we tell the program uh, where should the, the columns, uh, the entrances, uh, so what the matter are? That, that was totally top down decided. Like, so for instance, the library, the exterior was 3D modeled, the structural grid layout was predetermined in the 3D model, and the location of the ceiling where it would be pulled down was decided. And then it's just the, in fact, it's just really the, the formal resolution of that mm -hmm. and a little bit of the topological resolution that is defined through the algorithm. So there, that's probably the most minimal role of the generative um, in all those projects, I'd say. It so still played a role, but yeah. So in the beginning, you have just have some 3D model that tells where should be some elements of the building. Sure. Like, so for instance, in the Opera House, you, there was a 3D model that had the boxes for the program where it should be, and there were two people just constantly working through program, like planning, like in any project. Um, and that was getting masked on the site, but then um, we were working on also the simulation, and that was situated in the same location, but it was being constantly generated to work alongside that. And that one, so that was, they were a little bit disconnected, right? But they were constantly work together. In the, say, something like the, the airport or the library, the 3D model is provided along with collaboration with structural engineers, working out where we can fix, you know, down vertical loads, these kinds mm -hmm. of things. All the other architectural program is going on. Like an airport, you cannot ignore the pragmatics of some of these things. So, or a library. Um, but then when there is the defined moment of where that will be, then there is a simulation run to deal with that one problem in that one location. So, uh, yeah. Uh, and also about the airport. Do you, can I say some words about construction methods uh, to, uh, to build such a ceiling? It's so complex. Yeah, I mean, the, the airport was supposed to have permanent formwork, like milled timber formwork, so that you could drop it in as shells with the reinforcing still there. And that meant that you could create the deck of the roof and still have uh, on-site work going on everywhere else. And then it would be reinforced concrete, like poured in. So. But, but the form is so complex, and yeah. the, but, uh, so how can we produce such, such concrete? It was, it was milled timber formwork. Oh. It was very expensive. That's oh, what I was yeah. saying before. It's feasible, but not economically feasible for that project. So thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Because that was a low budget <laughs> airport, unfortunately. могут подумать, что я просто пижоню. Если можно, я отвечу тогда на тот вопрос, который я вам задал. Разрешите? Yes, please. Можно, please да? answer. Дело в том, что вот я начал говорить о внутренней и внешней геометрии. Вы можете взять два совершенно мягких тела, ну, положим, две резинки такие, которые можно надувать. Совершенно, две, совершенно. Как же эти две резинки сделать твердыми, ну, примерно вот неожиданно вот тут? <laughs> не применяя никаких-то там э, железных конструкций, ни в стержней. Вот э, дв две. Делать это совершенно элементарно. Просто одну вы делаете вот из силикона, положим, вот который покупается в аптеке, а вторую вы берете, делаете из, положим, из бычьей, которая не тянется, вот, категорически не тянется. Вот она не, не на один миллиметр не тянется. И вы одну... Вот, мягкую геометрию вы помещаете во внутреннюю геометрию и наполняете водой или жидкостью воздухом неважно чем но получено вот взаимодействие внутренней и внешней геометрии вам даст такую форму что вот этой формой можно будет просто невероятно делать чудеса ломать асфальт ну можете представить себе как вот футбольный мяч камера внутренняя совершенно мягкая зато то что сделано из кожи внутренняя оболочка она не тянется ни, на кап ни капельки, не должна тянуться. И мяч надутый, там, в пять атмосфер, он может, может проломить, ногу он ломает сразу, вот, не, неопытному футболисту. Там, или вот так. Поэтому, если этот принцип использовать в архитектуре, взаимодействие двух 
геометрии, то те формы, о которых идет речь, можно делать фантастически прочными. И причем сборка этих конструкций будет просто вот, ну чуть ли не ногой. Возможно, эта конструкция будет ненадолго собрана. Ненадолго. Но тем не менее, за этим, мне кажется, архитекторам будет это интересно. Спасибо. Thank you. Друзья, у нас еще есть время для последнего вопроса. Um, lots of discussions on that, um, especially in design research lab. But I never heard you answering that, so I probably will ask you. Uh, your uh, projects, probably like um, especially um, Helsinki Library, is a kind of combination of rationalization and generative approach when you try to when you build this thing by, with a dynamic shape, with a dynamic form which were run by certain rules, but it was like, let's say, stopped in certain dynamic. So how do you find in your projects a balance between rational and this, let's say, irrational bottom-up dynamic, and how you evaluate <laughs> the... Um okay, um, I'll answer two questions, actually. First one, you didn't ask, but that, that uh, surface in the library It's dynamic, but it reduces itself to a near equilibrium condition. So it starts off moving a lot, and slowly over time it stops moving, which means you don't have to think about when you should stop. Okay. It has decided itself when it is solved, and you know, so it reaches a near equilibrium state. Um, so that's the first part of that. The second part. Um, It's a really good question, and I think it depends on a project and the ideas a project generates, no? Like, well, it's partly the ideas a project generates and partly the ideas as architects we develop over many projects sometimes, like research agendas. Um, so, um, for instance, something like um, the library was more constrained than, than one would normally think. There were all kinds of things like There were vehicle tunnels underneath the site that meant you could not touch down in certain locations. That's why there was that big arch with the two big columns. Um, the, uh, you know, they weren't wanting to spend money on a, a very outrageous form, formal building. Um, there's also the cultural kind of context there a bit. You know? um, so there's all kinds of considerations, maybe. Um, but at the same time... Um, It's more like, where is the potential to do something exciting, you know? We thought that with the library, the circulation space, they had a few breakout spaces attached with that, um, was, you know, that and the interface between that and the outside was the place where you could have some fun. And then the ceiling of the main reading floor. Because those were kind of the areas where there's a bit of freedom and relaxation in the pragmatics. And also, the most uh, people would get to enjoy any effort you put there. Same with the ceiling in the airport. That's the location where everyone can benefit and where it could be most visible. So we concentrate on the areas in projects we think have the most opportunity in the project um, and also uh, the most impact you know, on the proposal, I guess. So yeah, it really depends. Like if it's, you know, if it's a, uh, like I was talking before about a residential tower, And the emphasis was on all the balconies and the facade um, because that was the place that was maybe where we could have the most impact on the project. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that, that, maybe that's from the pragmatic side. If you want me to answer from the generative side, well, the, I don't yeah, know. The question, what is rational for you? Because let's say the parametric approach is about like looking for the most efficient ah, okay. response. Ah. And when you... Uh, combine rational and your, let's say, generative uh, okay. dynamic um, thing. I see what you mean. Um, well, one thing we, I mean, we're interested in using computation for generative purposes, for creative purposes. So we're not 
so concerned with um, like pragmatics to us is something every one of us has to deal with as an architect. We take that as a given, we have to do it. But that's not where the focus of our computational work goes at all. The computational work focuses on the creative part. Um, and, um, and I think I was saying this the other day actually to a couple of people at the workshop that I think there is an overemphasis right now because of all the technical things computation can solve. There's an overemphasis amongst architects on the performance as se something that is justifying design decisions, um, which I think is threat, a threat um, of a resurgence in neo-functionalism in a way. Um, it's a neo-functionalism in the sense that it's, it's almost uh, justifying a design move purely from pragmatics. Whereas I would say as an architect, we, we have um, greater possibilities where we can answer the pragmatics, but also imagine other things that um, are beyond that that can play a role as well. And so for us, um, that part, the irrational part, I would say, not to say that it removes itself from rationality, it has to answer it, but it's not driven um, necessarily by those things. Uh, contributes to these things like for instance I mentioned words like ornament or expression or these kinds of things or something being intrinsic to something else it's not necessarily because of just a desire for efficiency it's for a desire for architectural expression to to be something that we strategically become authors of does that answer yeah that's, that's okay. good thank you thanks Thank you.